Hello everyone and welcome to Pisa Presents. Today we're going to be looking at feldspar minerals, a very interesting and varied group of minerals found not only all around the world but also all within. So why are feldspars important? I mean, why are we here? Now, first of all, they're not one, but instead a big group of aluminum silicate minerals with a general basic composition, as you see with that formula right there. Now, the X is able to be any one of seven different ions, things from, say, calcium to sodium, even strontium or rubidium. Now, these minerals are very common in igneous and metamorphic rocks, comprising over 50%, some will say 60%, of Earth's crust. They're also found in sedimentary rocks as well. Now, because of that, knowing and recognizing feldspars can help you to interpret the round world around you even better. That right there is their MINDAT page. And speaking of the world around you, I have never seen a MINDAT page with that many locations for a particular mineral. The section of the various localities where feldspars are found, various noted localities, is absolutely massive. It's staggering the amount of listed localities MINDAT has for feldspars. Now, there are two major groups of these minerals. First off, we're looking at the alkali feldspars, which are calcium poor and potassium rich, and they can be often very high temperature forming or really found in. Now, the second group is plage feldspars, plagioclase, include the albite to a northite series. Now, in mineralogy, a series is a set of minerals organized from basically one end to the other of a spectrum of chemical composition. So you have a low composition in a particular element all the way up to high, and then you have the minerals organized to reflect that respectively. So some common characteristics of these guys. Obviously, when you're dealing with many minerals found all over the world, they're not going to have the same color. But interestingly enough, some of their other characteristics are actually pretty similar. So while they come in various colors, their hardness only varies from a 6 to a 6.5. Their specific gravity ranges from 2.55 to 2.76. They have a monoclinic or triclinic crystal system as well. Now, what are feldspars used for? Ceramics, you both as a flux and as in glazes, as various household cleaners. Some of these are kind of the old-timey ones that you don't really use anymore that much. I do a lot like borax and things like that. Now, they're used also as a filler in various industrial products, such as paint, plastics, and rubber, and in various branches of the sciences and radiometric dating, so say potassium argon dating, things like that. You go to feldspar minerals for the key elements to use in that. Now, the biggest usage in the United States was actually something that surprised me when I looked it up. 66% of the usage of feldspar minerals in this country is actually used within glass making. I would have thought it was actually ceramics, to be honest with you. So firstly, we're going to look at some alkali feldspars. Now these lists are by no means conclusive. There are plenty other minerals and other group. This is just kind of like wet your interest on things and to show you some pretty pictures. So first of all, this absolutely stunning blue-green amazonite right there. And north of clays is right there. And first of all, well, right with this, I'm looking at some of these names here. Somebody like me that relies on public use images could not do this without people like Robert Levinsky. Whoever you are, buddy, thank you for posting everything that you do on Wikimedia because it is an absolute blessing for clubs like ours. So... Salute you, Robert M. Levinsky. Now, microcline, which to me looks like a big mass of Legos all glued together. Now, here is orthoclase. Now, some plagioclase feldspars as well. Albite is right here. Antacene is right there. Now, anorthite is interesting. You don't really find it that much in this country. It's found in places in, say, the Canadian Shield, so very, very old rocks in Canada, for those that don't know what that is. And its type locality is actually kind of like one of my little favorite quirks of geology. It is, oddly enough, in 
Vesuvius, well, on the slopes of Vesuvius. And yes, I do mean Mount Vesuvius, the super volcano that had a rather nasty fit in AD 79 and Pompeii, Herculaneum, and several other towns suffered the bad end of the stick. Yeah, that Vesuvius. Now, it is also found not really in this world, but in other parts of the galaxy as well. Most notably, you see an awful lot of anorthite every time you look at the moon. The big white bulges, well not really bulges because it's fairly round, but the big white sections of the moon, the bright white parts that you can see, those are actually that particular mineral, if you've ever wondered. Well, mostly that. By town, out. By town night is right here, and why can I never pronounce that? Labradorite is right there. And you see these differences in the pictures there, kind of the hue, it almost looks opalescent in some ways. That's a phenomenon that's unique to Labradorite. It kind of has, just like that, almost like a pearlescent or an opalescent effect that it can get. Now, here is an absolutely lovely oligoclase feldspar, again, submitted by the lovely Robert M. Levinsky. So I hope that that gets you guys a little bit curious or interested into the marvelous world of feldspars around you and not only around us, but all around us in space as well. So thank you very much, folks, and have a lovely day now for the rest of it. Bye.